The trouble with steeling yourself against the harshness of reality is that the same steel that secures your life against being destroyed secures your life also against being opened up and transformed by the holy power that life itself comes from. You can survive on your own, you can grow strong on your own, you can even prevail on your own, but you cannot become human on your own. <clears throat> Surely that is why in Jesus' sad joke, the rich man has as hard a time getting into paradise as that camel through the needle's eye, because with his credit card in his pocket, the rich man is so effective at getting for himself everything he needs that he does not see that what he needs more than anything else in the world can be had only as a gift. He does not see that the one thing clinched fists cannot do is accept, even from Le Bon Dieu himself, a helping hand. What he's saying is the self-sufficient person can bear lots of leaves but no fruit. And leaves don't count. Fruit comes as and only as we abide in Christ and He in us. Only from His life in us. His life is eternal life. And the only fruit He produces will not finally be destroyed. That's the warning and the promise. But the promise is bigger than the warning. It may not seem on the surface to offer much to us, to flourishing leafy branches, but it means everything to the ones that, having been hacked almost bare, want simply to be, by his power, what Christ would have them to be, which is what it is to abide in him. In this life, to be hacked almost bare, to have been sharply pruned, is to have suffered, and to have had many opportunities taken away. One can suffer, of course, without being a Christian, but it is a strange thing indeed if one is a Christian and knows nothing of suffering. It would be like the vine in Isaiah that was left unpruned, not to spare it, but by way of judgment. It would be wholly unlike Jesus, the true vine, who comes to us precisely as the suffering servant. In ways that are not given to us to understand in our fallen world, pruning and suffering are essential to genuine fruitfulness. Perhaps you have gifts you are longing to use. Perhaps longing to use in the service of God. But one door after another slams in your face. Or perhaps you have health limitations that have cut you off from making contributions that see surely to be for the good of others as well as yourself. Or perhaps financial problems or family stresses have sapped your energy. Perhaps you wonder what possible purpose your life can have. Perhaps you were just on the verge of success in some area when all you had achieved was suddenly taken away like tiny clusters of grapes snapped from the stem and seemingly wantonly discarded. For all you can see, there's nothing to show for any of it. That's the problem. We can't see. We don't know what God is doing. We can't see what God is doing. The cluster of fruit he is nourishing, the cluster so important that all the rest are expendable, may be hidden from our view forever, or it may not yet even exist. It may be a large cluster, one large enough that the branch itself must become sufficiently thick and strong finally to be able to bear the weight of it. And for that to happen, cluster after cluster of less desirable fruit must be broken off and the branch may for years produce nothing that is allowed to mature. And that is when it's hardest, I think, to continue to abide in Christ, to continue to trust in Him. 
That's when it is the most tempting to search for some other way, some quicker way and less painful way. That's when we most wonder if the promise is true. And that is how we learn that what we produce does not finally belong to us. That without Christ, we can do nothing. That the results belong to him is what frees us simply to seek to do right without the bondage to worldly criteria of success. He promises that he will bring forth fruit that pleases him and that brings glory to God. Eli Wiesel tells a story of a Hasidic Jew who had, excuse me, a Hasidic Jew who knew the strangeness, strange goodness of God. It goes this way. Two brothers asked the Magid of Mezrich, it is written in the Talmud that one must thank God for the good things as well as the bad. Is that not asking too much of humanity? Who would have the strength to praise the Lord for being punished? Magi told him, go and talk to Zuzio. This was a person well known in this area. Everyone there knew that he was sick and burdened with countless miseries and ailments. He was spared nothing. Zuzia, how can you thank the Lord? What about your suffering? My suffering? Asked Zuzia, amazed. Who is suffering? Not I. I'm happy. Zuzia is happy to live in the world that God, lest be he, created. Zuzia lacks nothing, needs nothing. Everything he wants, Zuzia has. And his heart is filled with gratitude. He had not even understood the question. <coughs> On another occasion, though, he felt it necessary to explain the problem of good and evil. And he did it this way. True suffering exists. Like everything else, it too comes from God. Why does it exist? I'll tell you. Man is too weak to accept or absorb divine charity, which is absolute. For that reason and that reason alone does God cover it with a veil that is pain. In his extreme naivete, Wiesel says he simply could not conceive of anything in creation not testifying to God's mercy. He too knew a God who only pruned that he might produce more and better fruit. The goodness of God is covered with a veil of pain. There is no resurrection in new life without suffering, crucifixion, death, and burial. The unpruned branch is the neglected branch, the branch that dissipates its strength, producing attractive, but useless shoots and leaves. Apart from Jesus, without his discipline, without his life, we can do nothing that matters or nothing that lasts. The disciples needed to hear that at the time that Jesus was preparing to leave them physically and what it would seem that almost everything they knew was lost. They needed to know that when they face loneliness and persecution, they needed to know, to understand it as best they could when it would seem as if everything depended upon them. They needed to believe it, believe it when the fruit was long in coming. And they needed especially to remember it in those moments when their own projects were flourishing. Because appearances don't count. Green leaves don't count. Everything that lasts, however, is the fruit of grace. Apart from me, you can do nothing, said Jesus to his disciples. He says the same to us. Let us pray. Dear God, you tend us as carefully as a farmer laboring over the fields and as lovingly as a gardener cultivating flowers. We thank you for the nourishment we receive from your hand, for the guidance that you provide in our growth, for the fruitfulness that you expect from us, which motivates us to grow in all grace. Deliver us, God, from the pride that would give us the illusion of self-sufficiency. We can do nothing without your love flowing through us. 
Deliver us from the self-pity where we deem ourselves inadequate to bear fruit for you. For with your care, Lord, each of us can be brought to fruition. None are dispensable. God, work through our lives that we may bear all the fruits of mercy. Help us always to abide in your spirit and use each of us to share the labor of the harvest. 